Well, good morning and welcome to the post-flight press conference for the STS-60 mission. The uh, crew of the mission uh, is joining us today. The commander will uh, introduce the rest of the crew, Charlie Bolden. And uh, again, this was the 60th shuttle mission, the 60, uh, 18th flight for Discovery. And with that, I'll turn it over to the crew commander, Charlie Bolden. Thanks very much, Kyle, and uh, welcome to everybody, wherever you are. Uh, very uh, quickly, let me reintroduce the crew since we've been through this before. Uh, all the way down on my far right, uh, Ron Sega, who was our mission specialist number two. Uh, to his left, Jan Davis, who was mission specialist number one. Uh, to my immediate right, my pilot, uh, Ken Reitler. To my immediate left, Sergei Krikalov, who was mission specialist number four. And to Sergei's left, our payload commander and mission specialist number three, uh, Franklin Chang Diaz. So what we're going to do from here on out, we're going to show you about a 16-minute video uh, that will give us an opportunity to uh, explain what we thought we did, and then you can ask us questions in case we did something that you didn't think we did, or uh, we didn't do something that you thought we did. And then we'll show you some slides that are primarily geared toward uh, Earth observations, and uh, after that we'll take questions and answers. So with that, why don't we go ahead and roll the video, and we'll make an attempt to describe it to you as best we can. The first thing you're going to see is uh, an advertisement from the sponsor. This is uh, the NASA logo, the meatball that we've all come to know and love. Uh, and these are uh, the two patches that we have come to know and love. They're both the um, English and Cyrillic versions of our crew patch. Uh, as is normal, we wake up, get breakfast, and then we go in and get suited up. And you'll see each of us in succession here as we go through the suit up and check out in the launch and entry suits. Uh, everybody trying to act like we're very relaxed and it's just another day at the office, but I think all of you know better by now. But uh, we were very excited about this flight. Everything had gone very, very well in the flow so far in the countdown. And uh, everybody but me was very confident that we were going to get off on day one. I still had it to be proved to me since I had never done it before. So it was a new and exciting experience. So. Everything was just about like the simulator until somebody said three, two, one, and everything started rumbling around and the engine slid off. And uh, we knew that it wasn't a simulator anymore. This is the real thing. On time launch. Beautiful morning at KSC. Feeling of those main engines and the uh, solid rocket boosters is just incredible. Feeling of being pressed back in your seat and accelerating upwards, followed immediately by that big roll to get us uh, aligned with our, our high inclination right up the east coast of the U.S. Not a whole lot to see out the windows because of the, uh, the attitude of the vehicle, but uh, really trying to pay attention to what you're doing inside at this point. The, uh, the first stage is pretty rough. It's uh, like riding down a country road, but uh, once the solid rocket boosters are finished up, about two minutes, uh, they come off in a, in a nice clean burst of energy, and then the main engines take you the rest of the way. One of the first things we do once we get on orbit is open up the payload bay doors, and this view of the payload bay, you can see the space hab module in the foreground and the wake shield uh, there, and uh, also after the wake shield, we had a gas bridge, which included a, a capel bridge and the Brimsat deployable and the Odorax deployable. And then we get right away to space hab activation. Basically, uh, this is the first order of business for us on orbit, and Jan and I got to do that. And uh, we found a few uh, traces of debris, uh, common in a new type of spacecraft. Uh, but we took care of that and got uh, down to the business of getting all the systems activated in the lab, uh, something fairly, fairly simple to get down to work. The uh, Space Hab module worked very well. All of the systems worked very well, and it turned out to be a, a really nice environment to work in. And uh, here we are checking out the initial systems and doing the setup of the module before we start doing the uh, experiments in the Space Hab. Even on the end of flight day one, we were busy doing DSO-201, which is sensory motor investigations. You see Jan in the foreground as the subject here with electrodes placed on her head, and there's Sergey as well with a small laser, which is the white thing, and the accelerometer on top. He's undergoing sinusoidal head oscillations. We perform <laughs> these exercises on day one, two, five, six, seven, and eight with Jan, Sergey, uh, myself, and Ken. This was another one of the Joint Science uh, Detail Supplemental Objectives, DSO-202, which was metabolic studies. And believe it or not, I've just inserted a catheter in uh, Franklin's arm. And if you look very closely, right down there by my left hand, you saw the blood just start flowing into the tube. Uh, I was pretty excited about that. Once Charlie and Franklin were finished uh, drawing blood from each other, then they handed it to me and uh, 
I was going to, uh, to work up the blood in this centrifuge. You can see that uh, we ran that centrifuge pretty much free-floating, worked just like a gyroscope. Once the samples were taken, uh, both urine and blood samples, we then had to uh, freeze them to, to make sure that they would stay preserved until we could get back and harvest the, the science. We used two freezers, GN2 freezers like this, to, uh, to put the samples in. This was always a pretty interesting time when you go down to the mid-deck and you see this fog and haze down there and you wondered what these guys were doing with, uh, with a GN2, sample, the GN2 uh, freezer there. So. Another part of the metabolic experiment, I'm not drawing blood here, as it may look like I am, but I'm actually measuring the venous pressure uh, of the blood that uh, we have already um, obtained the catheter for. And it's called peripheral venous pressure, a non-invasive way to get uh, pressure of the veins. We also did hermetocrit tests on the blood as well with another little centrifuge, and that's what I'm doing here, filling up capillary tubes from the blood and then inserting them into a, a small hermetocrit centrifuge, and I'd run those for a couple minutes and, and then record the readings. This is uh, the, the rack there in the back is called Eclipse. It's uh, one of our material processing experiments in the space lab having to do with uh, liquid phase sintering. It's from the University of Alabama at Huntsville. We had an, another rack, uh, kind of like this one uh, that you see here, and it was on the other side of the space hab, and it was called the SEF, Space Experiment Facility. And uh, it was probably the, the most interactive experiment we flew on, on the space hab. You see a crystal there at the bottom of the picture, the beginnings of a crystal that we grew for several, a well, couple of days actually, highly interactive with uh, keyboard entries through a, a small computer. and. Uh, the picture that you see there is the end when the crystal was completely formed and we get the feeling that it's a pretty good one. This was another experiment in Space Hab called ORCEP or the Organic Separation Experiment. It was actually two parts. One was a phase partitioning experiment and the other actually a, a, a live cell growth. It, both canisters inside and what I was doing here was actually conducting one of the many status checks that we did. This is in uh, what we call a CRIM. It's a commercial uh, refrigeration incubation module and it actually was able to keep the samples at desired temperature. This is another experiment. Um, we expose several materials in space and grow some biocrystals. And this kind of experiment could be very important in future to, to understand how we could use uh, weightlessness and um, to understand how, what kind of weightlessness we have in space. We had several other experiments, and uh, this experiment named uh, SEMS uh, record data from space hub, all vibration, acceleration, and we return this data back to Earth for development in the future. Another experiment we had was uh, protein crystal growth, and this is a graph on a power book that we had that shows when nucleation occurred. You can see the peak at the end. We had a laser scattering detector, which detected when a crystal was actually growing. And uh, we were real excited when we saw these two peaks and the two different CRIMs that we had, indicating that we had a really good crystal, and hopefully we have some good results from this protein crystal growth experiment from University of Alabama, Birmingham. This is another biological experiment, life science experiment, actually. Uh, we flew two cages um, with rats, and um, we took care of them. This part of the experiment, we show as we feed water in these cages. We had uh, over 50 of these uh, canisters that had uh, different tubes in them filled with different uh, biological uh, experiments. We had crystal growth, we had seeds, actually seeds that were flown on, uh, from LDEF. We had uh, actually miniature wasps and all kinds of different uh, biological experiments and we activated them by mixing two fluids together and in some cases we used these incubators where we would take out the individual tubes and place them in the front of the incubator and uh, and monitor uh, the temperatures and other data from those experiments. 
very late uh, addition to our experiment uh, list was this ex Sterling Orbiter Refrigerator Freezer, which we uh, filled up with uh, drink containers to check out how it worked. We also had uh, some ice cream on board. The first time in the history of space program that astronauts enjoy truly real ice cream. And uh, we, really, we really had a good time with that. You get an opportunity to see, um, see us in our in action here uh, on the mid deck as we all, the ice cream is packed in small containers like the, the old uh, food containers that, that I think most of you became accustomed to before we started using uh, the much more flexible ones. It was quite, quite delicious. Um, we had an opportunity to, to perform a couple of uh, in-flight maintenance activities. This one got, I think, a little bit more visibility in the, than the others. It was this collapsed rubber duct that provided a means of transporting air from the orbiter into the space hab module. It, eventually, what we ended up doing was just taking the cover from our Atlas uh, plastic cover and inserting it kind of as a stiffener on the inside of uh, this rubber duct here and then reinstalling it. It worked very well. This is another experiment to understand what kind of environment we have on board. It's very simple, but it's allowed to visually see what kind of acceleration we have on board space shuttle. These are some of the scenes of preparing food in the, in the mid-deck, which you probably have seen in the past, uh, but it's a matter of just simply uh, rehydrating uh, uh, containers, plastic containers, with uh, dried out food. On Flight Day 8, this is a special night. We call it International Night. We uh, not only had uh, chopsticks and uh, Japanese food, curried chicken and so forth, but we had the small Russian uh, bread loaves as, as well as cheese uh, dip that Sergei arranged to have on the flight. So we, uh, we ate everything from American uh, uh, jerky to, uh, to Japanese and, uh, and Russian food on Flight Day 8. It's a more challenging way to have dessert here, as, uh, as Sergey, uh, I think, has a cashew bounced off the uh, flight deck lockers. So each each one uh, was uh, was more challenging as you'd expect. And here's Charlie on the uh, on the ergometer. Each of us had an opportunity to exercise on this uh, this basically a, a, a fixed bicycle, and we uh, we thought that was very important. We were so busy in flight, we probably would li have liked to exercise a bit more than we got a chance to. Let me try to look nice. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a, a scene of just brushing teeth and basically uh, how to maintain yourself in the, uh, in the environment of the, uh, of the space shuttle. In my case, I, uh, I slept in the space hab, so not only did I transport myself down back and forth uh, during the uh, normal days, but also in the evening. We had the opportunity to uh, send a couple of messages to the Russian people. In this case, we were singing a lullaby, Spyat Ustali i Grushki, which uh, it means tired toys are sleeping. It's a uh, traditional lullaby right before the evening news to put all the children in the right frame of mind to go to sleep. This is during some of our RMS activities. Uh, I think actually Ron was operating the arm in that case, and I was backing him up. This is during one of the unbirthing of the wake shield. Uh, we had really good luck with the arm. It was very smooth. and. Uh, our training prepared us well for these activities. We had four uh, unbirths, actually three unbirths, I guess. And uh, this is one of the times when we rotated the arm uh, so that the wake shield hardware could uh, look at uh, different atmospheres. The horizon sensor was looking at different things and checking out the hardware on the wake shield. We noticed uh, on flight day four that the attitude control system had a problem. And one of the attempts to diagnose this was to bring the uh, wake shield over the overhead windows of the, uh, of the orbiter and look at it with a camcorder and looked at the, the mechanical motion. We did uh, a growth on the port side arm and very successful with respect to vacuum and films. And we also could control it from laptop computers there, as you see on board. Very interesting experiment in plasma physics uh, used the uh, wake shield as a source of voltage and uh, we would observe the actual changes in the uh, luminescence of the wake shield at night with an uh, image intensifier optical train on board. This was uh, the deploy of Odorex. And uh, as you can see, the balls start coming out. There were a grand total of six spheres, uh, metallic spheres, and they were used for subsequent tracking by radar sites on the ground. Uh, our primary site was Egland Air Force Base, and uh, there's also a backup site in Kwajalein. But this was. Uh, Pretty interesting to watch, and, and uh, you see these balls go trailing out and, and then kind of coming together again out there, and they're 
They'll probably be there for a couple of years, orbiting until they finally burn up in reentry. Uh, the next deploy that we had, and both of these occurred on Flight Day 7, uh, was the deploy of the uh, Brimsat satellite from the University of Bremen in Germany. A uh, very small, lightweight satellite, and its primary objective is to uh, do some ob observations of Earth's atmosphere while on orbit, and then during its uh, subsequent reentry, which will come in a few months, uh, to actually collect data uh, about the makeup of the atmosphere as it comes back through. Well, we had a very busy flight and on uh, flight day eight. We actually closed up the hab, uh, closed the hatch out, as you can see here, and deactivated the space hab. We were really busy um, the night before trying to stow things, and the morning of entry, we also uh, were very busy um, trying to clean up everything on the mid deck and stow away all of our equipment and uh, get ready to, to come back home after. Uh, busy and we felt a uh, very successful flight. This was hilarious because remember the bicycle ergometer that we were on? This is it or pieces of it and I remember hearing Ron and the guys down on the mid deck going what? Pieces were just going everywhere <laughs> as they're trying to gather them all in and put them back in their place. Time to get back into the uh, launch and entry suits and get ready to come back. Uh, this re-entry came in right across Alaska and Canada and down across the uh, heartland of America and right in across Atlanta. It was mostly daytime, and so we didn't see a lot of the real spectacular uh, fire that you see sometimes, but uh, it was a very, very clean entry. Uh, we did have to go around one time because of there was some concern with weather. That was not a problem at all. Very comfortable just sitting there in your suits. All the work was done. It's just a matter of letting time pass and letting the weather work itself out. <coughs> weather was great. Charlie made a real nice approach uh, over the Cape and uh, brought uh, Discovery in for, a, for just an absolutely perfect landing. It was. Uh, Great, uh, great ending to, uh, to a really fantastic flight as far as I'm concerned. The, uh, everybody had a lot of concerns about the weather. I think on board, uh, we just kind of roll with the punches and roll with the flow. We were very confident when they finally told us that we had to go for deorbit. And we had had an opportunity to see the weather on our previous pass. And uh, knowing the folk that worked the weather and, and knowing that Hoot was in the shuttle training aircraft making the evaluations, I was very comfortable, and like Ken said, it was a gorgeous low level. It's, it's what it seemed like coming down across Alaska and Canada, right through the heart of the U.S. Uh, we did deploy the drag chute. We did a little bit different procedure than has been done before. This was the first time that we actually deployed the drag chute prior to initiating the derotation. Um, it was unbelievably smooth, uh, very, very stable when the nose came down. All of your speeds end up being a lot slower than you're generally accustomed to but it makes the orbiter very, very nice to handle. And uh, I, was, I was very pleased with the handling characteristics of the orbiter there. Um, this is, again, a one last word from the sponsor. And, uh, and that finishes our, our video.